Our first uh, session this morning is a keynote conversation. It is uh, entitled Reverse Engineering the Brain for Intelligent Machines. We, uh, we have a treat um, ahead of us. Jeff Hawkins and uh, Subatai Ahmed are on a mission to reverse engineer the brain. In this session, they'll, they're, they're going to discuss how tackling this scientific challenge, the progress they are making, and why brain theory is necessary to truly um, and create truly intelligent machines. I'm going to put my brain someplace here. How about right there? Can I balance that? Is that going to work? There we go. Actually, you bring yours here, too. What's that? Well, you know, I can refer to it, uh, perhaps, uh, over there. So thank you, Becky. That's a nice introduction. And thanks, for everyone, for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to, for me to be here. It's an honor. Um, you know, Cornell is really where I really kick-started my passion for understanding how the brain works. So it's particularly an honor to be here. Yeah. And um, uh, we're going to try to do something. Um, it's a little awkward. We were supposed to be you know, interviewing ourselves. But Subita and I have been working together now for, what, 12 years? Yeah. Uh, we're a very, very close collaboration. We sit right near each other. Um, we have a small business, uh, Numenta, which is about 15 employees, full-time employees. Uh, we swell in the summer when we have interns and, and visiting scholars. Um, uh, but uh, we also have a fair number of Cornellians. Our, our director of engineering is also a Cornellian. Uh, and we've had a number of interns we've over the years. A whole bunch of interns. Yeah, uh, I don't know why that Cornell, is. We don't, yeah. we don't go out of our way to do that. We're not like a, a Cornell hiring shop, but somehow they find us. Um, so uh, that works pretty well. So should we delve into it? Yeah. Let's, uh, yeah. OK, so uh, how do we want to start here? So I think um, you, you're going to talk about neuroscience and what yeah. we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve at Numenta. Yeah. yeah, so I'll start off with what the big goal and the big picture here is. And we are going to have time for questions at the end, so you better pay attention to those complicated instructions on how to ask us questions, because apparently <laughs> we're not allowed to take them any other way. So, um, so start thinking about that. Um, look, uh, Subutai, you know, he's had a long interest in, in lifelong learning and how the brain works. I, too, um, I didn't really fall in love with brains until uh, right after I graduated. It was the fall of 79. And, uh, but I decided at that time that I wanted to really dedicate my life to figuring out how the brain works. Um, and uh, it's, it took a long time to get to position to do that. But uh, we think we're working on one of the most interesting and important uh, uh, problems ever about anything. I mean, if you think about our species, the human species, we're unique and really in one way is that we have a unique brain. Otherwise, we're kind of uh, not very interesting animals. Um, but we have an intelligent brain, more so than other animals. And uh, the whole nature of our success and our lives and our social structures are the knowledge, even that the, the very notion of knowledge can't, be, uh, can't exist outside of the framework of the brain. And so uh, if we want to understand what life is about and what the universe is about and what we as species are about, uh, there is no more central question than what does the brain do and how does it, does it, how does it do it? Um, and so that we have a once in a forever opportunity to figure that out. Um, it's going to happen once, and it's only going to happen once. And uh, intelligent species can do it. And so what the hell? Let's go for it. Um, and that's what we do. We, uh, we think it's going to have a lot of, uh, is it, by the way, it's not as pie in the sky stuff. This is actually happening. We're, it's going to happen it's in the middle of it. It's, it's, it's actually happening right now. So it's not like, oh, we hope to do this. We're doing it. Um, uh, it's going to have a lot of impact. Uh, if you think about our world, uh, we, we, have been, we, we spend so much time educating our children, but we actually don't know how, how we learn. We don't know how, uh, well, we're starting to learn how it is we form memories and how it is that the structures of the brain actually do this, and so it can inform pedagogy. Uh, we have a whole series of issues related to uh, uh, psychology and, and uh, neurology, which can be uh, impacted by um, knowledge about how the brain works. It is purely, of course, it's purely interesting on a pure scientific and philosophical point of view, just knowing how it wants, so how it works. Um, but also, uh, we also believe that um, there is going to be a very, very um, important and um, a large industry and impactful uh, on our societies about building intelligent machines. And uh, we don't believe you can build intelligent machines unless you understand how the brain works. So much of what you hear about an AI today is not really about intelligence. It's, it's nothing really at all like what brains do. Um, and so we're trying to get to the core of that, the core principles um, about what, uh, how brains work. And that's going to inform the future of AI, uh, or we prefer to say machine intelligence. Um, and if you're worrying about this, it's nothing to worry about. Uh, we can talk about that, too. The, the risks of this are not what you've heard about, if, you, if you've heard about the existential threat of this. 
Um, anyway, so uh, that's, what we're, that's what motivates us. I think everyone who works at Nementa is deeply, passionately um, uh, interested in this topic. We think it's important to work on. It's exciting to work on. It's fun to understand. I wish you all knew what I knew because it's fun and interesting. So we'll be able to share a little bit of that today, just a little bit of it. Um, I should mention before I turn over to Subutai, the next thing, that everything we do is open um, as a business. So uh, all of our research, all of our code, everything we do, it's, it's not easy necessarily to follow, but if you're really interested in what we're doing, you can go to our website and you can learn about all of it in detail. It's nothing secretive going on here. Um, but I think uh, what, what might be useful now is for Subutai just to chat a little bit about, he's in charge of all of our research, and to chat a bit about um, you know, the state of where we are, what have we known, what, what have we figured out, what, what are some of the remaining challenges to go uh, through. Are you ready to do yeah, that? Definitely. Uh, yeah, definitely. So. We were going to have some amazing slides, but we came too late, they couldn't accommodate them. So you're going to have to imagine <laughs> how amazing it is. Uh, so. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, so I'll try to give you a little bit of a feel for kind of the state of neuroscience and how we go about thinking about this. And what does it even mean to have a theory of intelligence that's sort of based on uh, neuroscience? So I don't know how much uh, you guys know about neuroscience, but the field is absolutely exploding. Um, it's amazing, the, the innovation that's going on in the, in the research there. There's somewhere around, I think, about 50,000 neuroscientists in the world uh, being researched in this. It's a pretty large field uh, worldwide. Um, but the, the sort of set of recording techniques and the, the technology they have for measuring neurons and the chemicals and everything that's going on in the brain is just exploding. Yeah, it just, almost, I, I, yeah. We'll interrupt each other here and just make it yeah. more interesting. There, there's the annual Nas uh, the Society for Neuroscience Conference, with as many neuroscience conferences, but the big one, they have over 30,000 neuroscientists go to it every year. I mean, it's, it's huge. That's just in the United States. Yeah, I think it takes like 15 minutes just to walk from one end of the hallway to yeah, the other. Yeah, just yeah. To forget about actually reading all the posters. But yeah, so the field is exploding. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like there's a Moore's Law in neuroscience. Um, it's not unusual today for researchers in the field to be recording from, say, let's say, a thousand neurons in awake, live, behaving animals. So they can actually give these animals tasks and see what's happening and, and look at the uh, neural responses and try to get, get patterns. Um, there are several labs that are close to being able to record from an entire animal, basically some species of fish, uh, being able to record every single neuron within that fish while the fish is swimming in 3D and being able to visualize it live. I mean, it's just unprecedented what's going on. And this kind of advance would have been unthinkable, I think, uh, even 10 years ago. Um, but although I think where we come in is, although there's a lot of data, um, there's actually surprisingly very few theories of how the brain actually works. Uh, what is the actual functionality behind these things? And I think we've learned a bunch of things from speaking with neuroscientists and working on our modeling that I'd like to kind of share a little bit with you. Uh, so one of the things we've learned is that uh, the, the model of how you think about a neuron is really important. So if you look at most machine learning and deep learning uh, technologies, they have a very, very simplistic view of what a neuron is. Uh, their view is sort of it just takes a bunch of numbers, add them up, and then send some signal. Well, ne real neurons are a lot more complicated than that. They have a beautiful uh, structure to them. There are specific sets, uh, you know, locations that they get input into the neuron, the specific areas that they send output. Um, there's temporal dynamics in the neuron that are really important. And it turns out that if you really study that and understand that, it tells you a lot about how the brain learns, how we deal with temporal structure and streaming information, um, you know, how we behave, how we send out uh, motor commands and so on. There's a lot of uh, detail in, in the kind of the structure of neurons that's actually important to model. And most of the machine learning stuff today completely ignores that stuff uh, to its disservice, we think. So that's one thing I think we've learned. Uh, the second thing that uh, we've learned is sort of the opposite, is that much of the complexity around brains, and if you look at neuroscience textbooks, you'll see these you know, extremely complicated diagrams of all of the regions of the brain and how they're hooked up and how every region is doing some specific function or the other. And it turns out that you can actually ignore a lot of that complexity. There's a commonality and a common structure across uh, all of the neocortex. Uh, and if you just focus on those common principles, you can actually reduce the problem to a much more simpler problem and just focus on that. Would this be a good time to show some props? And, I can just, and I'll, just, I'll just yeah. illustrate that. So, um, so <laughs> If you think about your brain, this is a model of a human brain, and um, 
if you think about it, there's uh, actually about 75% of the volume of the brain is this thing on top, the neocortex, and that's the thing that's unique to mammals, and that's the thing that makes us smart. So uh, we're interested mostly in the neocortex. We have to understand how it relates to other things. And if you could take this neocortex, which is all wrinkly like this, and if you could lay it flat and iron it out, it'd be just like this. This is my favorite prop. It's about this thick. It's only a couple millimeters thick, and it's about this big in area. So it just gets all scrunched up to get inside. And um, so this is you, right? This is it. There's, a, there's something around 30 billion neurons in here. And I'm not joking. This is it. This is you, and this mind speaking right now, and yours is listening. Um, but the amazing thing, what Supertai was just talking about, there was these different regions. You know, oh, this region does language, this region does vision, this region, there's like a hundred different regions here. But what Supertai was referring to is if you slice through that two millimeter thickness, um, you see this very complex structure of cell types and layers and connectivity. But it's the same everywhere. It's almost identical everywhere. Um, it's also true across species. So if you took a mouse's neocortex and sliced through it, you can't tell it's not a, it's a mouse versus a human. It's almost identical. And, but it's detailed. So our goal, and what Supertai is referring to, is what we're really trying to figure out is what is that common structure doing that exists everywhere in the cortex, if you slice it everywhere. Because if you understand what, how vision works, you understand how touch works and how hearing works and how language works. It's hard to believe, but that's true. Uh, it's a very interesting, complex, repetitive um, sort of learning algorithm. Yeah, yeah. I think it's um, often, often here it's said that, you know, vision is done in this part of the brain and language is done in this part of the brain and uh, audio is this part. But I think if you take a slice of your cortex and show it to a neuroscientist, they won't be able to tell you where it's from. Yeah. You can't actually tell by looking at it. Uh, the only reason the visual part of your brain is visual is just because it happens to get input from your retina and happens to process visual information. So it's a pretty striking. Yeah, and they've shown that if you, you know you could route if you can route the the census, uh, the data coming from your skin into the visual part of the brain. You don't do this with humans, but they've done it with some other animals. Um, that that part of the brain takes over uh, a different meaning. So we're looking for this, this, this sort of uber com, uh, common algorithms that are that are applying across all uh, aspects of intelligence, uh, and that's what we're making progress in understanding. All right. Yeah. yeah so that's, I think, that's a little side. Yeah. <laughs> I think I have to use my props here. So. You know. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's actually as, as modelers and computer scientists, it makes our job much, much simpler. It just says we can ignore much of the complexity and sort of blur eyes and focus on the commonalities and the common principles. And there's a lot that we've learned uh, on that. I think we're making uh, really good progress on that. Um, you know, I go to neuroscience conferences all the time and just, you know, talk with experimental neuroscientists. and. We're, they're starting to be, I think, a common understanding of the theory of how the brain works and, um, it, you know, and where we go from there. So we're, we're making really good progress on that. Uh, over the last few years, we really, I think, tr started to understand how the brain processes temporal information, how it takes in uh, streaming sensory information and makes predictions. So that's a core piece of what the brain is doing. And some of the new stuff that we're working on, maybe you want to expand on that is yeah. uh, we're really starting to figure out how the brain generates behavior and how it uh, sort of deals with uh, constantly changing information. Yeah, it's, it's a problem. We can, I'm so t tempted to go into detail here that, that some people would want to hear and other people are like, what the hell is he talking about? Um, but um, I mean, just to give you a sense, what we do here, we actually are modeling large structures of real complex neurons in our, in, in our business, in our, in our lab. We, we model the networks of hundreds of thousands of very complex neurons in structures as they exist in the neocortex. Um, and that's what we do. And so we're getting a deep understanding exactly how some of this tissue works. Not just a fuzzy understanding, a very, very detailed understanding about it. Um, they, they, we had a real uh, breakthrough this last year, which uh, I'll mention. Um, we, were, we were asking ourselves, it, it, there's a thing called sensory motor inference, which is like mostly you're not aware of this, but most of the way you learn about the world is through movement. Um, you're constantly moving. You're moving. To learn what something feels like, you have to move your hands over it. To learn what a building is or a structure, you have to walk through it. Uh, even when you're just sitting here looking at us, your eyes are constantly moving three to five times a second. You're not aware of it. The input to your brain right now, if you just look at my face, the input to your brain is changing completely three to five times a second from your optic nerve. You're not even aware this is happening, but this is an integral part of how the brain works, how the neocortex works. And uh, we made a real sort of important discovery this last year, exactly how it is that those changing patterns uh, based on your own behavior lead to modeling the world as it actually is. 
um, how is it you learn the structure of the world through movement? Uh, and that's um, that's a key key ingredient. It's a, it was a real breakthrough this last yeah, year. It's a pretty critical part. I mean, I yeah. think most of the changes that are coming into our sensory organs are due to our own behavior, not because of the uh, the world changing. So being able to model that is a very critical yeah. part of it. I, it's a I, I, I'm so excited. It's a real <laughs> breakthrough. So you're going to hear more about it over the coming years. Um, but anyway, I digress yeah. from no, whatever we are. Uh, so that, hopefully that gives you a feel for uh, what we're doing um, and you know, how we're going about it and kind of the depth that we're going into it. And the, the key things, you know, one is that neurons are more complex than it might seem at first, and it's important to model that. And the second part is that the brain is perhaps not as complex as everyone thinks. And there's a set of common principles, and by focusing on those common principles, we can really hope to make progress. Oh, that. a little color to that. If you're trying to imagine a neuron, just Neurons are these complicated, they have somewhere around 10,000 connections on each cell. And um, what we've learned, I'll just share this with you, what we've learned is those, they're not like a mass group, it's not like, a, a, you know, like a, some sort of mass thing that happens all at once, that individual neurons can learn hundreds of unique patterns and, and respond very precisely in hundreds of unique ways. Most people don't think about neurons like that. They think, oh, it's getting some input and it has an output. What we've learned is a neuron is very, very picky. And individual neurons will say, this pattern I've seen before, and that pattern I've seen before, and this pattern I've seen before. And it's a very precise um, um, way of working, even though the neurons themselves are kind of noisy. Um, so anyway, just adding some, yep. just imagine this thing with look like a tree with 10,000 connections on it. It's uh, pretty incredible. And you've got about 30 billion of those in your neocortex. Um, yeah, OK. What's yeah. The, yeah, anyway. So I think you want to talk a little bit about the applications and the impact of what we're doing? Uh, yeah, I think you know, there's a lot of, I already mentioned some of those impacts earlier. I, I think um, uh, the one that's getting a lot of attention uh, now is the whole idea of machine intelligence. And maybe it's worth exploring that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of noise these days about AI. And most of what's happening in AI is not really intelligent. It's machine learning techniques. They're very good. They're powerful. Uh, they're, not, they're very useful. We're not trying to say that that's not the case. But they're not even getting close to what most people say is AI is not even getting close to what, what it is that we do as humans and how our, our flexibility and, and ability to learn about almost anything. Um, so um, we think what we're doing is the core of what really is going to be the future of machine intelligence. Um, and it's very hard to know exactly how that's going to play out. We, we think that, um, first of all, machine intelligence is going to be built on the principles of the brain. Uh, that's what, uh, one of our beliefs. That's not a commonly held belief today, but that's, we're very confident in that. And, um, and that it allows us to build machines that are not at all like humans. The goal is not to build like human-like things. That's a, that's a mistake. The goal is to build machines that work on the same principles of the brain but can be applied in other areas. I'll just give you one sort of very simple example. You know, an intelligent system has to interact with its environment and discover the structure of its environment. That's what we do. We, we learn about the world through interaction with it, uh, and we discover the structure. That's what science and, and, and what we do as societies. And, um, but you could build a machine that works on those same principles, that works at the nano level, that's it's discovering the structure of proteins and understanding how proteins fold. And it could be, a, it could be running the same principles, but in a very different time scales and very different sizes. It's going to have an impact as broadly as uh, computers have had on our, our society in the last 70 years. 70 years. Um, and it's going to be as big as that. But it's, don't think about it as robots running around and talking to you and taking over your job. That's, that is not what this is about. <laughs> Uh, just like computers didn't do that, I think I can do that. But it's going to be an amazing impact on our societies going forward, uh, and it will transform the world in many uh, exciting ways, which I'd be glad to talk about later. Yeah, it may be worth uh, maybe give sort of a historical perspective on AI and how it's evolved over the years as well. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, um, so you can kind of think of uh, AI um, as being in kind of three different epochs. Uh, at least that's the way we, we kind of see it. There's sort of classic AI, what you might have learned about in school, and this was typically, um, you know, very hand-engineered. Uh, you know, people would uh, interview experts, they'd write down rules. There's these sort of expert systems, and uh, you'd create this big database of knowledge and if-then kind of rules. And that was, uh, and you know, that has uh, you know a lot of applications. Uh, that sort of AI is actually still around today. If you know, I've heard of IBM Watson. Uh, that's basically that style of AI. You know, we kind of call that AI 1.0. Um, then there's kind of the world, uh, kind of the machine learning world that we're immersed in today. Uh, you might have heard of buzzwords like deep learning and so on. 
while the classic AI, uh, the AI 1.0 guys were uh, working, people started to figure out how to get machines to learn, how you can give it data and, and tune its parameters and get it to sort of recognize basic patterns. Uh, but uh, you know, this was all going on during the 80s, but they didn't have enough data and they didn't have enough compute power. But today, they, there's, you know, computers are way more powerful and you know, with the internet, there's data, tons of data available and so the machine learning techniques are becoming a lot more popular and, and actually delivering huge amounts of value today. Uh, but the problem with, with those systems is that they're, as Jeff was mentioning, they're extremely brittle. Uh, you, know, you tend to train them on data and even though uh, it's, you, know, you don't have these hand engineered rules, they're still kind of recognizing the patterns that are in the data that you give it. And it's very passive and extremely brittle. So if you're aware of um, you know, the DeepMind Go system, for example, uh, they beat the world champion Go player, uh, a feat that was thought you know, was extremely difficult. Um, but that system, even though it can beat uh, the world's best Go player, can't actually play tic-tac-toe. Uh, you'd have to completely start from scratch in order to get it to play tic-tac-toe. So we think uh, this is gonna lead to AI 3.0 which is this biologically based intelligence, our work, our work. Our work. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, in order to really have flexible intelligence systems, you have to look at the neuroscience, you have to look at the only existence proof there is, and you have to understand those principles and be able to uh, uh, you know, build models of that and build yeah. systems. And today we have, a, we have a pretty good list of what those principles are. Some of them we understand deeply, some of them we don't, but, uh, but we can say for, right, for certain today, most of these AI systems aren't even remotely like an intelligent system. Uh, uh, we make sure we can leave some room for some questions yep. here. Do we have anything else we want to talk about before we do the questions? No. Um, oh, uh, maybe it's a little bit about our, our business. Yeah, this is like, you know, it, it, you know, we have a VC <laughs> introducing us here and so on. We have a kind of unusual business model. Uh, we have to work, uh, we're not a classic, uh, Subhutai and I both have worked at previous startups. I started Palm and Handspring and he's, he's worked in the vision space. Um, but Numenta is, is a business, uh, but we don't really have a product. Um, uh, and no VC would fund us. Um, they, it's funny because they all come to us all the time, like, we're really excited what you're doing, you know? And you say, no, you're not. You're not going to want to give us money. And, and, uh, but, uh, but it's interesting. You have to be extremely patient. We have to be yeah. really patient. Yeah. I mean, we've been at this for 12 years so far, and we're going to be at it for quite a few more. Um, our business model is, though, is, an, is one of intellectual property. We have, uh, for a small company, we have over 30, we have some like 35 issued patents. Uh, some of them are very fundamental. And I know from my work in mobile computing that those things become really valuable later. Um, some of the, many of the patents I did when I was at Palm end up being extremely valuable and a lot of litigation over many years later. So we kind of have a patient business model here. We're really focused on the science and, and I think we'll pay, well, it'll pay off in the end run, but we're not, we're not focused on that now. But uh, we do have some licenses already, but we're not using